There aren't many people who can afford the real thing. But in Boston's financial district, a highly successful business has enabled one man to indulge his passion for money. About 24 times expected earnings, and although some of the small cap stocks have been hit, there's some really good values left. Thank you. I'm in the investment management business. I started Delphi at the end of 1979 with one client, and we've grown the business nicely. We have really no marketing. We have roughly a billion dollars in assets. I made my first million in 1985, and rather than spending on a fast automobile or a ski chalet, I was interested in buying a Claude Monet. It, to me, it symbolized true genius, and I was 39 years of age, and I spent 77% or $770,000 of my liquid net worth to buy the painting. I did not grow up wealthy, but I did know of Monet as a youngster, and my mother and father had reproductions on the wall. But to be honest, given my economic circumstances, I never expected in my wildest dreams ever to own a real Monet. Now this afternoon, I'm gonna go up to Portland, Maine to visit my two Monets. I grew up in Portland, and I get a great deal of pleasure out of loaning it into the small Portland Museum of Art. And it's like giving back to the community. In fact, one of the real joys is to watch other people watching my paintings. And I don't go up to them and say, that's my painting, but it's interesting to see their reaction. This is the first painting that I bought, the View to Cap Martin, Monaco, 1884. When I first saw the painting, and it was actually hanging on the rack in the vault in Christie's, I said, this is a beautiful Monet. It was pristine. It was as if it had dried yesterday out of Givigny in his studio. When I got the painting, obviously I was elated, but you can't stand up and cheer in the second row of Christie's, but that's what I was feeling internally. But later, when I left the auction room, I actually cried, and I said to myself, gee, this is like the Lifetime Achievement Award. God forbid if I went bankrupt, I do have 31 paintings. The other 29 might be for sale, but the two Monets stay in the family into perpetuity. And I'm not finished yet. I'm still in my early 50s. I figure I got another 14 to 20 years of good collecting, so I hope there are a couple more Monet landscapes in my future. I hope so, Scott. You can't go wrong. I can think of other things that you could buy, that you could go wrong with. Scott and I don't necessarily agree on everything that he buys. We, we often do, but not always. But we normally agree on Claude Monet. Always. <laughs> week in New York, and Scott is hoping to add another Monet to his collection. One of the things I always do is I examine the condition of the painting to see if it's been restored, and if there were a major area of restoration, obviously that would be a deal breaker because you want to buy an original Monet, not an original restoration. So let's have a look with the ultraviolet light. And I, oh, I find that uh, central area pretty good, isn't it? There's hardly anything. Only a couple touches of in painting on the, the That's center. right, those little black spots there are more recent paint, probably restorers touching in. Well, I think that's it. I think that's pretty good news. I think it's a lovely picture and great state. I agree with you. I think it's in beautiful condition. And, and the interesting thing is it used to belong to Frank Sinatra, which is, uh, I think, a fascinating little extra dimension to it. <laughs> I'm always nervous before any major auction because it's not every day you get to spend a couple million dollars. I hope I'm going to get it. I love the painting. I'll be an aggressive bidder as I always am, but you never know on a given evening what will happen in the sales room. Lot 54. Lot 54, the money. And $1,200,000 for this. $1,200,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1,300,000. $1
went all over France painting a whole range of different sorts of landscapes. But he was also trying to paint the extremes of weather. He was trying to paint stormy seas. He was trying to paint the rain, trying to make himself feel he could conquer nature in some sort of way and get it all down on canvas, even when it was incredibly difficult. His worst day at Etretat was when he misread the tide tables and very nearly got washed away. Apparently, the waves came up and splattered him against the stones, and he ended up with his paint all over his face, struggling out of the waves. And he said he was very lucky not to have been washed away and actually swept to his death. Monet often said he never had a studio. In fact, he was telling lies. We know he did. But he made a great point of getting journalists to watch him painting out of doors in very extreme conditions. He wanted to create the myth of himself as the great natural artist, who was about as close to the nature he was painting as he could possibly be. Monet was a great marketeer, and he was his own PR person. That is certainly true. I think that he is someone who is both savvy about the market and very careful to be able to construct a kind of vision of himself that he wanted to project. He knew the public wanted a particular kind of mythology, and he fed it to them beautifully. While he was on his painting expeditions, Monet yearned to be back in the new home he'd found in the village of Giverny. Monet discovered Giverny in 1883. He came here with Alice Horchaday, who'd been deserted by her husband. The two families settled in an abandoned cider farm in the heart of the village. As his work began to sell, he could afford to indulge his other great passion, gardening. said that if he had not been a painter, he would have been a botanist, and that it was, in fact, flowers that led him to becoming an artist. It is these flowers which are like the dabbles of paint upon his own palette, and it was ultimately a place that he makes into a kind of Eden, where nature itself is going to be controlled by the human. Formerly, of course, allowing it to have its own drama, he now can be the conductor of that symphony. Moni was very influenced by a trip he took to Holland about five years before he, he made this garden, um, in which he saw laid out all the tulips in bloom in great sort of massive swatches of color across the landscape. And I think when he came here, he wanted to create that effect. He laid it out along the lines of strict geometric patterns with a long alley that runs right down from the center of his house. And then on either side, the beds laid out crisply and clearly with strong rectilinear shapes filled with flowers that would bloom over the course of the seasons so that the colors themselves, hot against cold, would in fact create a kind of visual intensity to the garden that would be like the intensity that he attempted to achieve in his painting. While his garden grew, the surrounding Giverny countryside inspired Monet's next project. Working on several canvases at once, he attempted to capture the changing envelope of light around the subject. We're right on the spot where Monet painted his poplar series, one of the most famous of the series. He came down here one day and found that the trees had been marked up for felling, and he paid to have them left standing for long enough for him to capture the light going through these leaves and the branches and the reflections in the river, and then after that, they were obliterated. He said that the light changed so frequently that he needed a new canvas every seven minutes because the light had moved off a particular leaf. Of course, this all made life, in fact, completely impossible. And we know that towards the end, he had 20, 30 canvases sometimes heaped around him, and he used to scrummage around among this pile in order to find one that matched the effect that he was actually seeing in front of him. And by the time he got it on the easel, the effect had gone. So it was a real struggle to keep up with nature. 
One day he got so frustrated that he just threw all his equipment, canvas, easel, the whole lot, into the river, went off back home and then thought, oh God, you know, and came back, fished it all out again, started all over again. And at times he really wanted to give up the whole business of painting. He said it was just a crazy, mad thing to do. He was very uh, tough. He was known as somebody very difficult. The tradition is that when Manet was furious about a certain number of what he had made, uh, he asked, uh, ritual, ritually, I can say, uh, to the gardeners to, to take these paintings that he didn't like and to burn them. A big fire in the garden, you know. This was the only way to burn them. <laughs> Monet and Elise married in 1892. The life of their household revolved around a routine of monastic strictness. He's a man who gets up very early for his work, 4, 4.30, according to the season. And the first thing he does is just to look at the sky. He's a kind of peasant, you know. He needs the beautiful weather, he needs the light for his work. So he would be very, very ill tempered if the weather was bad and um, won't paint. Some days he would feel so desperate and so distressed and so depressed that he would go back to bed and stay and nobody would approach him. And also the next day he would recover and be all right, excellent mood, singing, very nice little songs and he would apologize and say, you know me and I feel so sorry. This is Monet's studio. This is the first studio he had, and he had three studios. If he couldn't go outside because of the light, he was finishing inside his work, and he didn't want to be disturbed. He hated to be disturbed. And if people were coming without any appointment, he would really not receive them. Meal times were extremely strict in this house, like in a monastery. 11.30 for lunch, 7 o'clock sharp for dinner. And nobody was, would have been allowed to any delay. He hated stupid people and he hated people being late. Food, drink, good company, hospitality was absolutely basic to Monet. And he loved to have friends around to dinner who came and had an impeccable meal served by a range of servants cooked by a range of cooks. Food was as important to Monet as his gardens, and he cultivated his kitchen just as carefully as he cultivated his gardens. Monet accumulated his own cookbook of recipes from his travels, and he loved extremes of contrasts in tastes. For a first course, maybe seafood from the Normandy coast, where he himself came from, but then combined with a Mediterranean spice like saffron. And then the second course, duck, but then duck combined with figs. And then he even had recipes for Yorkshire pudding that he brought with him back from the Savoy Hotel. He was fascinated by varieties and extremes of taste, just like he was the varieties and extremes of visual experience, all presented in a way that kept up this image of a person who lived life to the highest standards in terms of all the pleasures of life. 